pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invitation to talk with you. Uh, let me get down to my slides. And this is what I want to talk to you about tonight. I want to start with definitions. What is food security? And whether it's the same thing as hunger. I want to talk about who is food insecure and why. What can be done to meet the food security challenge itself? Uh, even without climate change, food security is going to be a huge challenge with the growing population. Then how climate change will affect food security, picking up on some of the things that John was talking about. How much do we know uh, about the effects of climate change on food security? A lot of this science is just coming out. Um, the explosion of science over the last decade has been amazing to me. And it's really affected um, the, the optimism that I think people had earlier about the prognosis for the impacts on agriculture and food security of climate change. And then I want to end up on a, a upbeat note with practices that can both help to achieve food security for everyone and reduce the negative impacts of global climate change on agriculture and vice versa. As John mentioned, climate change both affects agriculture and is affected by agriculture. So starting out with the definition of food security, this is what the Food and Agriculture Organization defines, how it defines food security. It's a condition that exists with all people at all times, I guarantee I'm not going to read many slides to you, have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences, many of which are culturally determined, for an active and healthy life. There have been two major rounds of goal setting uh, in which different nations got together and said, we're going to um, make a commitment to reduce food insecurity worldwide. The first commitment was 1996 at the World Food Summit to reduce between 1990 to 92 and 2015 the number of undernourished people by half. And then the second, the Millennium Development Goal number one, which was to have the proportion of people. So moving from the, the absolute number to the proportion, keeping up with, with growth in um, population. Of course, the Millennium Development Goals are about to expire and there's a big effort now to develop sustainable development goals. Food security is a big part of the sustainable development goals and equity, there's some new things that are coming into play with the sustainable development goals that we didn't really see with the Millennium Development Goals. So the question, is food insecurity the same thing as hunger? No. FAO is very clear that food security has four dimensions. The availability of food, which is simply the, the quantity of food. Access, whether people can get to that food utilization or consumption, whether people are actually able to eat and their bodies are able to digest, take advantage of the food. Uh, utilization can be affected by um, disease, the, the uh, person's physical condition, and also can be affected by things like food safety. And then stability, which is an overarching concept that applies to all three of the other dimensions of food security, stability of availability, access, and utilization. The Food and Agriculture Organization gives us numbers every year in a report called the SOFI, the State of World Food Insecurity. The SOFI 12 came out uh, several months ago, and I've been working with Francis Moore and a group of probably 20, 25 other academicians and NGO people um, from, from different organizations critiquing the SOFI report because we were really distressed by some of the, the ways that it is framing the solutions to food insecurity now. We've arranged a call with some people at FAO 
um, in a week, and I'm really looking forward to being able to talk to them about some of the issues with Sophie. I'm not going to go into depth on, on what the problem is, or the problems. There's really a, a constellation of problems. We'll be issuing the report soon. You could look at smallplanet.org, which is Francis Moore LePay's website, and she'll be posting that. We'll be posting it in several other places. I think she did a brilliant critique of the SOFI. The first big issue with the SOFI is that it's not really reporting food insecurity at all. Despite the title, it is reporting something that FAO calls extreme undernourishment, which is a really dire level of hunger. It's a situation that exists when people don't even have the caloric intake for sedentary lifestyles for over a year. And most poor people are not living sedentary lifestyles. They aren't hanging around watching TV. They're out working really hard. So this is a, it's a, a metric that is underestimating the number of hungry people. When we look at the, the um, trends in extreme undernourishment, yes, those numbers are going down somewhat. And FAO is saying that the Millennium Development Goal is in reach because we just need to continue doing what we've been doing. We need to put a lot more money into economic development, that that's been successful. But if you look at the trends for a normal active lifestyle, they have not improved. Another big problem with the, the SOFI 12 is that um, it's masking some big discrepancies across regions and across countries. Most of the gains in food security have been in a few countries like China and Vietnam. And if you look worldwide, you will see many regions, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, where food insecurity has actually gotten worse since 1990. The, the trend has been worsening instead of improving. But FAO has been reporting that globally there's a worldwide improvement in this metric, uh, which because of the title of the report, people assume is equivalent to food insecurity, but it's really not. So take a look at smallplanet.org in, in just a few weeks, and we'll be uh, posting the, the critique. This is what FAO says is going on worldwide with the metric that they are using of chronic undernourishment. Um, right now, well, 2010 to 2012, these are the most recent figures, uh, things don't look so good. The dark red, this is a standard thing with these, these maps, the dark red shows the most acute problems. Sub-Saharan Africa with a few hot spots, South America and Asia. South Asia is also not doing very well at all. When we look at where hungry people actually live, if you look at the, oh, I don't have a pointer, but, but it's okay. You guys can follow this very easily. If you look at where the greatest numbers of people are, they're in um, Southern Asia, primarily India, uh, but also Sub-Saharan Africa, followed by Eastern Asia, and then the, the little group up at the top are all the other regions. So greatest numbers in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia, even though in that map that I was showing you just a minute ago, it looks as if Southern Asia is, is doing relatively well compared to um, Sub-Saharan Africa. The people who are in this state of extreme undernourishment are half, more than half, smallholder farmers. Farmers, but still extremely undernourished. So undernourished that they are not even getting the calories they need for a sedentary lifestyle. Most smallholder farmers worldwide are women. The next biggest group is rural landless. Many of these people are also farming, but they don't own land. Followed by urban poor, followed by another group that's trying to um, make their living by uh, capturing or raising food. Pastoralists, livestock uh, raisers, fisher folk, and forest dwellers. 
So about 80% of the world's hungry, this is everyone outside the urban poor, are themselves involved in food production. This is one of the things that has led people to conclude that hunger and food insecurity are issues of economic distribution and social justice, not just food production. Another pretty obvious clue is that right now, the world is raising enough food to feed everyone, but we're still seeing these, these really dramatic rates of food insecurity. Another thing that should be cluing you in that this is a problem of, of uh, social justice is that people in very wealthy countries are hungry too. These are the latest figures for food insecurity in the United States. About 15% of US households are food insecure and 5.7% of those households are living in a condition of what's called now very low food security. It used to be called hunger until Congress said that they didn't want the, the word hunger uh, being used in these reports. But for all practical purposes, it's, it's hunger. These are people who don't have the quantity of food that they need. The highest food insecurity in the United States is in households with incomes below the poverty line, not surprising, surprisingly. Households with children headed by a single woman, Hispanic households, black households, and Native American households, but they are relatively small, so they're not showing up as one of the largest groups. 50.1 million people are living in these food insecure households, 8.6 million children in food insecure households in which both children and adults were food insecure. Um, adults will usually suffer the consequences of food insecurity first. Adults will try to protect children as long as they possibly can from food insecurity. So the fact that we have 8.6 million children in these food insecure households where children are also affected is pretty bleak in a country as wealthy as the United States. My conclusion from studying food security over the last um, 25 years really is that the wealthy world is basically answering the wrong questions. We have focused on trying to increase availability of food and a lot of rhetoric about feeding the world, which coincidentally benefits companies that are based in the United States, rather than working on improving food access, reducing our own overconsumption, which is contributing to food insecurity around the world, and addressing why poor people can't feed themselves. It's a little bit like that story of, of the person who has lost his keys and he's looking under the street light for his keys and someone comes up and says, well, did you drop your keys here under the street light? And the guy says, no, but, but the light's so much better here. <laughs> we are looking at places where there's a lot of money uh, trying to find solutions like public-private partnerships and investments in high technology that's not particularly accessible to the poorest of the poor because there's money there. Instead of trying to find the solutions that will really benefit the poorest people in the world. So a couple of slides on why so much hunger exists. We see a pattern worldwide in poor countries of inadequate investment in agriculture. This went down, down, down since the 1970s. There's been a little blip up recently as several wealthy countries have recognized that it's extremely important to be investing more in agriculture, partly for global security. Um, the, the Arab Spring was stimulated in many ways by food insecurity, by people who couldn't afford to buy bread because the price of bread had gone way up. So people were rioting in the streets. And this is the kind of thing that makes governments really uneasy. So they've decided to invest more in agriculture and also just recognizing that this is the way forward. This is what we have to be doing. We're investing more in smallholders and women too, which is critically important because there's been an unequal distribution of benefits from the agricultural investment that's happened 
since um, oh, 1950. I was part of the big international assessment of, it was called the ISAD, the um, International Assessment of Agricultural Science, <laughs> Knowledge, and Technology for Development, in which we looked at the results of the last 60 years of investment in agricultural science and technology. And some of these conclusions that I'm reporting to you are coming out of the three years that I spent working on the ISTAD with uh, 400 other scientists from around the world, looking at what we can actually tell with confidence have been the results of the investment in agriculture. Unequal distribution of benefits was a clear, unequivocal um, consequence of the, the studies that we were reading. What we also see that's contributing to food insecurity and reasons why these very poor farmers can't make enough money to buy the food that they need that they're not raising is lack of infrastructure, lack of roads and markets, lack of access to resources that people need for agricultural production, which includes seeds, water, uh, credit. This is particularly acute for women because in many countries, women can't own land still and can't get credit and can't get the kinds of resources that are available to men. A very disturbing development over just the last 10 years or so has been a rapid rise in what's called land grabs and water grabs that are the result of wealthy countries and corporations moving into very poor countries frequently that don't have secure land tenure systems or water tenure systems and buying up land not to the benefit of the people in that poor country, but to grow food or biofuels that are exported to wealthy countries. There's several um, uh, organizations, including the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, that have been paying a lot of attention to these land grabs and how they can be addressed in some way by, but, but right now, the best thing we have are voluntary guidelines for reducing the, the impact of land grabs. So if we go beyond what we see on the ground in poor countries to try to get at the root causes of food insecurity, population growth is clearly one of the problems. That's making it harder everywhere for people to achieve food security. Conflict is also a big problem. And wealthy countries are aggravating conflict by increasing the militarization of some areas. Environmental degradation due to overuse of resources is creating problems in many countries. Uh, and this environmental deg degradation is more often than not due to industrialized agriculture. I would define industrialized agriculture, by the way, as agriculture that adheres to the principles of industrialization, simplification, mechanization, homogenization, and concentration and centralization. Uh, so it's, it, it's not something vague. There is environmental degradation that happens just because of poverty, too. People overuse resources because they feel they don't have a choice. Pressures on food supply and other resources that are due to overconsumption by wealthy people and wealthy countries are also contributing to food insecurity, particularly through diversion of cropland to biofuel production and diversion of food crops to feed animals. For many of the crops in the world, well, in the United States, we are, the, the figures change so rapidly, it's been hard to keep track of them. But biofuels in, I think, 2009 were 17% of grains in the world, and feed crops were, uh, between biofuels and feed crops, it was about 50% of the grains of the world. So grains are going into animals far less efficient than people being able to eat those grains directly. More root causes of food insecurity, financial speculation on food commodities, which became far easier in the early years of um, this century as 
speculation was deregulated in different ways. Poverty and rising income inequality is also a root cause. And then finally, the, um, and this is really closely correlated with income inequality, the decision making has increasingly become concentrated in the hands of fewer people, fewer and wealthier people, like the slide that Tyler showed us of the political power that the oil companies are able to buy. Um, political and economic power are held by minorities in almost every country, and in the food system, we're seeing increasing control over food system decisions by a small group that controls bottlenecks in the value chains, in the food supply. So what can be done to meet, first of all, this food security challenge? The first thing that I would emphasize is that it's important to support the right to food worldwide. This is something that more and more countries are accepting as a given, as a principle, that underlies any policies that are taken that affect people's access to food. I'll talk about this a little more in just a few minutes when I get to some of the win-win the solutions that can both address food security challenges and climate change. We can invest in small-scale farmers, um, including access to resources, better tenure systems, and agroecological practices. Is that term completely unfamiliar to anybody in this audience? Okay, uh, agroecological practices, I will explain a little bit, a little bit more when we get into climate change. But they're production practices that encourage closed nutrient cycles, encourage um, uh, biodiversity and greater resilience of the agricultural system. Well, I'll give you some examples in just a few minutes. We need to invest in women, not just in women who are farming, investing in their farming organizations like the picture down at the bottom, this is a group of women who are meeting in India. But we also need to be investing in contraception and education, which are proven methods to slow down population growth. One of the best ways to slow down population growth. If we can avoid that nine to 10 billion people peak, then we're better off all around. We need to create a global social security net. More and more people are talking about this now because some countries simply cannot afford to put money into the kind of social security net that wealthy countries have. So if all countries are contributing to a global social security net, then that can be distributed as needed to countries that face crises. We need to be supporting local institutions and building greater local infrastructure for markets and supporting local governance of food systems, people's ability to make decisions at the local level or regional level at the most over what happens with the food that's being produced, how much of it goes into international trade, the ability to set up food reserves, for instance, which are a big safeguard against food insecurity. So, moving on. What difference is climate change going to make? Um, not all that long ago, in fact, at the third climate assessment, which was 2007, the TAR is uh, the third assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel. You, you guys who've been uh, following through the course probably know TARs and FARs and all these, uh, all the terminology, all that well. But even in 12 years ago, the TAR indicated that impacts on Food systems, this was the third, which was, what year, 2001, I want to say, uh, indicated that impacts on food systems at the global scale might be small overall in the first half of the 21st century, century but progressively negative after that. Uh, they posed this winners-losers scenario in which developing countries are going to suffer more and earlier than developed countries because the developing countries just don't have the capacity to invest in adaptation. Uh, they don't have the technology that's needed to address climate change. 
So they were saying things wouldn't look all that bad up until 2050. We are already seeing really severe impacts of the climate change that has already happened. So this has already been shown to be overly optimistic. The modeling that was done early on, I was part of a, a project out of the Global Environmental Institute at, at Oxford University and worked with the fellow who was one of the co-authors of the, the food and forestry uh, chapter of the fourth assessment. And he said that what they were looking at in their models was a steady increase in temperature and they were looking at factors in isolation. They weren't looking at everything all together in the way that we now know biological systems function. So they were looking at, at carbon fertilization, they were looking at temperature, but not looking at the way that pulses in temperature changes can have dramatic impacts on agricultural systems. Having too many warm nights can be deadly for some agricultural crops. Not having those a sufficient number of hours of nighttime freeze can be deadly for some crops. Each crop has its own ideal set of circumstances and human societies have evolved with agriculture over the last 10,000 years to use particular crops in particular places. We're experimenting in a period of decades and causing changes in what can grow where. We're experimenting with something that we've developed over millennia. So this was one of the assumptions that temperature really is the most important factor. And I would say we're looking at this whole stew of factors now. That's where the emerging science is coming out. The interrelations of temperature, pulses of temperature, uh, carbon dioxide, precipitation, water, drought, when the water comes, uh, how long the drought lasts, how long the flood lasts. So the complexity has increased tremendously. A second assumption seemed to be that agriculture would just kind of migrate north, <coughs> sort of like birds. I don't know if you guys have ever flown over Canada, northern Canada. The last time I came back from Europe, I flew over this area that's shown in the, the map there as blue around the Hudson Bay. That's called the, the Laurentian Shield or the Canadian Shield. And it is a bleak, bony, stony landscape. If you compare the soils uh, on top of the Canadian Shield with the soils in the Midwest just below, which have been the, the breadbasket of the United States and have been a major source of exports of grain crops to the rest of the world, they are worlds different. The Midwest has soils that are 50 to 60 feet deep. A lot of that soil has been lost. It's eroded down the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico, causing all sorts of problems there, which is a, another whole story. But it's not going to be that easy for a number of reasons for agriculture just to move north. Agriculture is one of the most place-based occupations in the world. People have deep attachments to their places. They're not going to just pick up and move easily. Uh, to northern Canada, and even if they did move, they won't find the soil they need to be growing crops in the way that they're growing crops in the Midwest. A third assumption was that production was the most important thing to consider, instead of impacts through the whole food system. There are very important impacts of production, and what we're seeing is that heat, and carbon dioxide thresholds exist for most crop plants. All livestock have heat thresholds, and it's the number of, of heat degree days, the, the days where, heat's ex, where the, the heat exceeds a certain amount that's a real killer for livestock. Um, the three main crop plants in the world, wheat, rice, and maize, are all very sensitive to heat. 
And as heat rises, we're going to see problems with all three of them. We could switch to different crops. People are talking about switching over to cassava and bananas, but they're not the same as wheat, rice, and maize in terms of protein and caloric content. Um, drought and floods, obviously, more crop and livestock pests and disease. These are some things that, that John mentioned. Ocean acidification, which is dramatically affecting coral reefs because the coral can't, can't build in a more um, acidic ocean as the carbonic acid is acidifying the ocean. A lot of the carbon dioxide is being stored in the ocean and being converted into carbonic acid. Um, the picture shows millet, by the way, and millet has been considered one of the most heat and drought resistant crops. This is a picture from Ghana of what happened in a year where there was drought and a lot of heat. The, the ear below is showing the, the difference in production. Uh, more impacts on production, more extreme weather events like Hurricane Katrina, the unpredictability of the growing season. USDA just issued a new plant hardiness zone map showing that the, the uh, frost-free days are increasing throughout the United States. The picture below is Iowa in the 2011 flood. That was a major, major problem for the Midwest, and now they're in drought. So going from extreme drought to flood, back and forth, that's really devastating for agriculture. And the uncertainty is also really devastating for agriculture because farmers don't know when to plant, what to plant. It, it creates all sorts of problems. There are also impacts on consumption and access to food. Lower fish catches will be increasing the demands on land-based production. The climate refugees, the sea level rises, will increase food demand from humanitarian aid sources, but at least in the short term, not be able to feed themselves and decreased production and increased demand will be exacerbating competition, including the competition between wealthy countries and poor countries for land and resources uh, to raise food and biofuels. Biofuels, I, I'm not sure if you guys had a whole session on biofuels, I don't remember, but different biofuels uh, have very different impacts one of the big issues, though, if you look in the middle of this chart, um, the use of resources during growing, harvesting, and refining of, of biofuels is pretty high for most of the biofuels that we're using now. And a lot of those resources, such as fertilizer, pesticide, energy, they take energy to make energy from biofuel. So fertilizer is a very energy-intensive process. Creating nitrogen fertilizer, creating pesticides is very energy-intensive. So biofuels are, are not really uh, a clean solution. And even if, if they were, the amount of land that's needed to grow the biofuels to really serve the current demand uh, is way beyond what's available. There are systemic impacts of climate change, trade-offs between adaptation options. Biofuel is probably the most dramatic of these trade-offs, but they exist throughout. Sea level rise will have effects on distribution of food as well as on production. Uh, throughout the food system, the most vulnerable people, the poorest people, and the people who live in areas that will be hardest hit by climate change have the least capacity for adaptation to climate change in the food system. And finally, I strongly believe that industrialized agriculture will become increasingly untenable, simply because burning fossil fuels will become increasingly untenable. We will realize as a society that we can't continue burning all this fuel that exists technically, but we're toast if we actually try to use that fuel. Um, contributions of food systems to climate change. Uh, agricultural production is the main contribution. I'm not going to go through in the interest of time. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But agricultural emissions, the, the small circle there, uh, looks like gears. 
but the small circle is showing that agricultural soils, the emission from soils, is about a third of all the agricultural production impacts. And then enteric fermentation, which is livestock, uh, burping up methane, um, that's 31%. And then other emissions, rice paddies, uh, rice cultivation, manure management, manure mismanagement, all of those are also significant. And then fertilizer manufacture, pesticide production, you're seeing these are also emitting greenhouse gases as well as using a lot of fossil fuels <coughs> the way they're being done now. And in fact, every single stage of the food system is completely dependent on fossil fuels now. Um, the Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security Program of CJAR, the International Research uh, Conglomerate, says that the food chain, excluding agriculture, contributes at most 5% of global emissions. But if you look at the contribution in, in uh, industrialized countries, like the UK to climate change, after the farm gate, then it can be over 50%. Uh, this chart is from Tara Garnett. It's showing uh, emissions from the post-production stage. And she finds agriculture only is, is contributing 40% in the UK. So here are the win-win solutions, the no regret solutions. At the farm level, we can increase energy and water use efficiency. We can actually do that throughout the food system. It's a no regret policy. We can use far more renewable energy on farms. We can use agroforestry, uh, growing trees and crops together, and just basically get more trees out there on farmland. We can restore degraded soils and minimize soil disturbance to enhance water holding capacity and sequester as much of the carbon as possible. We can close nutrient cycles and diversify crops so that at least farmers will get something if one crop fails. FAO put together a really gorgeous little idealistic vision of how things can be uh, managed best on a farm um, in a community to take full advantage of um, farm products and turning them into energy and uh, using renewables in every possible way. And then at the state and regional level, uh, the first thing is to recognize the right to food, again, which would give priority of food production and food access over biofuel production or other uses of land, such as industrial uses of land. This map is showing adoption of the right to food around the world as of 2011 to 2012. Some other things that can be done at the state and regional level are to localize and regionalize food systems, to invest in renewable energy for food systems through more research and implementation, and to get rid of those biofuel mandates. We still have it here in the United States. EPA refused to get rid of it. Eliminate until we have more energy effective methods that aren't using feed crops or residue that's needed to be turned back into the soil as compost for soil health. And a final slide, at the global level, we need to slow down population growth by providing access to education and contraception. We need to change food consumption patterns in high income countries, eat less, Eat only as much as needed instead of overconsuming, which is the big problem in this country. Eating less meat, eating seasonable and seasonal and local foods that don't have to be transported such long distances. We can reduce food waste dramatically. Food waste is 30 to 40 percent worldwide. We can adapt, but recognize that this is really not a solution. It's just buying a little time. And I would end up with what to me seems the obvious thing that has to happen globally, reducing emissions and doing it immediately.